without numbers is like rain without clouds and there's a good reason for this too because number is the basis of almost all of our mathematics but very few of us really understand what a number is for example that four is certainly not a number it's just a pile of purple paint on a pile of yellow paint it's a symbol for a number which mathematicians call a numeral well if that isn't a number what is one of the ways we can begin to understand this is to go back to our friends the animals some animals have an ability to recognize numbers if you don't make them too big and if you don't ask the animal to name them. A bird, for example, has very little difficulty in recognizing the loss of one of her young. This idea of a primitive number sense is something that even human beings have to a certain extent. For example, if I have this card here, which I flash up, and ask you how many dots there are on it, you can probably tell me without too much difficulty that there were four of them because you can recognize this number four almost without counting. On the other hand, if I use a card with this many dots on it, you might have quite a bit of difficulty recognizing the number of dots there without counting because most humans don't have the number sense that can get up to seven without actually counting the seven dots. Now, this isn't strictly true, however, because if I flash you a card with that many dots on it, you can probably recognize nine. Here, though, you have a geometric pattern of a three by three square, which aids you in doing this. This might help us to understand a number somewhat, but it's more difficult for us to understand the idea of numbers without going back to the idea of sets, which you should know something about. If you remember, sets are a very interesting idea, and sets depend mostly upon the concept of a collection of things, because a set is only a collection of things which is described in a way so that all of us know exactly what's in it. Now, the members of a set are the things that make up a set, and of course we have to have a way of writing sets. Sets are usually written by a pair of braces, Inside these braces, we put the members of our set, a square, a triangle, and a circle. The important thing we're interested in, however, is not the members of the set, but the relations between sets such as these. These two sets, for example, made up of oranges and candy, have a characteristic that we can easily recognize. There's something about these two sets that's alike. Now, it's not the oranges and the candy because there's very little resemblance between them. In order to find out what's alike about these two sets, we can make use of a very simple and easy technique, the idea of pairing the members of the sets. For example, we can pair an orange and a piece of candy, another orange and another piece of candy, another orange and another piece of candy. And when we do this, we see that both sets have now become empty. There are no members left in them. This is only true when we do this. It only happens this way when the two sets have this characteristic that we were talking about. For example, if this set had another piece of candy in it, this wouldn't work because when we paired off the candy and the oranges the same way we did before, we would have an empty set of oranges, but the set of candy would still have one of its members there. Now, it's very important when we do this that we realize something has happened here with these two sets which makes it very interesting because the set that was paired off with the oranges was, this, was the thing that we recognized about these two sets. It doesn't matter what the sets are composed of. This set could be composed of keys, for example, and the same idea would happen if we can see that resemblance or character between these two sets. A set of an orange and a key, an orange and a key, and an orange and a key can again pair off so that all of the keys and all of the oranges would be taken care of. 
Another way we can do this is not to use oranges or keys or candy, but to use something which doesn't have any particular meaning to us. For example, these three cubes, which we can put in this set. And now we get the same idea expressed here, that we have the pairing between a cube and an orange, a cube and an orange, and a cube and an orange. Now let's let this set, made up of the cubes, represent all of the sets that can pair off with it. Not only the set of oranges and the set of candy and the set of keys, but all of the possible sets that we could think of which can pair off with this set of cubes. Then this represents the idea of this property or characteristic of sets which can pair off with this one. This property is called a number property, and this is where this idea of number comes from. Because for every set that exists, there is a standard set like this, which we can conceive as being made up of cubes, which pairs off with it. For example, the standard set that's made up of these cubes will pair off, for example, with my two hands in this way, and so it's the standard set that stands for my pair of hands. Now, it's not always convenient for us to represent this idea of a number property with standard sets. For that reason, we associate a number with each of these standard sets. The standard set which we have been using and which represented our oranges and candy and keys has associated with it the number three. And the standard set, which is composed of a pair of things, is associated with the number two. The standard set consisting of a single thing has the number one associated with it. And the standard set, which is the empty set, has the number zero associated with it. Every standard set has a number associated with it. And if we arrange these standard sets in a sequence, we get an arrangement much as we see here, with the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and finally up to 13 and on without limit. This sequence of sets, as we just saw, is each associated with a number. And if we take away the sets from the sequence, all we have left is the sequence of numbers, which is there. The three dots, of course, mean that this sequence goes on without any limit, literally forever, because there's no end to these numbers. These numbers are called the natural numbers, or whole numbers. Natural numbers because they are naturally derived from the idea of sets. An arrangement like this permits us to count with these numbers, because, for example, if we want to know how many fingers we have up here, we start and pair off a finger with the first of these numbers, forgetting, of course, the idea of zero, giving us one, two, three, and four, and when we reach the last finger, we have counted the number of fingers that we have. Primitive man, unfortunately, had no easy method of counting such as this. One of the most primitive forms of counting there is, is one which in reality just uses the standard set in order to count. These three stones illustrate a very primitive form of counting, where they actually stood for the number three in the system that was being counted. A slight improvement on this, although not very much, is the idea of a tally stick, which is represented by this simple stick notched with three such notches, representing the same idea of three things. Tally sticks, however, could grow quite complicated and were used in England up to about 200 years ago by some merchants. This rope, similar to the ancient Inca idea of counting three things by putting three knots in a piece of rope, is another method of counting by a very primitive form. The ancient Chinese and Japanese developed a system which is slightly more complex than this, but which still, in the beginning, uses the same ideas. For example, we put down one counter like this for the number one, and two for two, and of course three, four, and five for the first five numerals. Six, however, is done a little bit differently because for six we just put one down and put a thing on top of it, like a T, and for seven, we put another one down like this, and so on. The ancient Japanese were able to count up to 100 by this still rather primitive form of counting. As civilizations developed, however, numeration systems became more and more complex. This is the ancient Egyptian system, which consists of the numerals 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on in multiples of 10. We're all familiar with the ancient Roman system, which, as you know, consists of these numerals, and I'm sure you know what they are. This last one might be a little bit of trouble, because that's the way the ancient Romans wrote the symbol for 1,000. 
An early Central American Indian tribe called the Mayas had a system of numeration which was an extremely advanced one. They used symbols like this, one, five, ten, and this interesting one down here stands for 20 because their system was based on the idea of 20, and this is one of the first instances of a zero that we know in numeration. If we like to see what one of these systems looks like written in a number that we can recognize, we can use the number 637, which looks like this in the ancient Egyptian system. Notice the six 100s, the three tens, and the seven ones. And then in the Roman system, it looks like this, which I'm sure almost all of us can read without any difficulty. And finally, in the Mayan system, our Central American Indian friends, it has this rather interesting relationship with the dot on top representing 400, the two lines and dot 220, and the three lines and two dots 17. The standard set then represents the property of number, which was exactly the same in ancient Egypt as it is here today. And no matter what system we use, Roman, tally stick, our own, or some other, we are still communicating this idea of the number property of sets. Number sense is a part of us, although thousands of years were necessary for the development of a good numeration system. You can spend many happy hours learning to count and compute in one of these ancient numeration systems, but whether you're adding two and two or figuring with some ancient Egyptian numerals, you are still relating sets to numbers. Thank you.